story of the week, maybe story of the year. Who Congrats. knows? Disney's board waving its magic wand and poof, Bob Chapek is out after less than three years on the job. He will be replaced by his predecessor, former Disney CEO, Bob Iger. Iger, of course, has been the face of Disney for decades, serving as chief executive of the company for 15 years before stepping down in February 2020. He stayed on as executive chairman until last year, and now he's back in that top role. Disney releasing a statement late Sunday, writing, quote, as Disney embarks on an increasingly complex period of industry transformation, Bob Iger is uniquely situated to lead the company through this pivotal period. According to the release, Iger will serve as CEO for two years and help pick his successor at the end of that time period. He will also be tasked with setting the strategic direction for renewed growth at the company, which could potentially include some more M&A deals. Iger made significant deals during his time as CEO, leading acquisitions of Pixar, Marvel, Lucasfilms, and 21st Century Fox. Disney Plus also launched under his leadership, debuting in November 2019, just a few months before he stepped down as CEO. He was then replaced by Bob Chapek, who had a very tumultuous tenure, stepping into the role just before the start of the pandemic. Disney parks, of course, were quickly shut down as a result of COVID-19, costing the company billions of dollars. As if that wasn't enough, we had actress Scarlett Johansson suing Disney in July of last year over alleged lost profits due to the hybrid release of her film Black Widow on Disney+. Plus. And then came the political crosshairs. Chapek was at the center of a PR nightmare after backlash when it came to his response over Florida's so-called don't say gay bill. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis stripping Disney of its self-governing rights over that dispute. And then just a few months later, Chapek catching heat again for the firing of Chairman Peter Rice back in June. All of this weighing on investor sentiment, which has also been challenged by Wall Street's renewed focus on profitability. The company did report weaker than expected results in its most re recent earnings, which included a $1.5 billion loss in its streaming division. The stock is down more than 35% year to date, with Disney executives warning that growth may slow even more in its fiscal first quarter. Today, however, shares are up on that shocking return of Bob Iger, up over 6%. All right, great stuff, Ali. And please stick with us because you're going to be joining our guest panel now. Joining us for more on Disney's leadership shakeup is Bloomberg Businessweek writer Felix Gillette and New York Times reporter John Koblin. Thank you both for joining us. And of course, Ali as well. They are both authors of the new book, It's Not TV, The Spectacular Rise, Revolution and Future of HBO. Um, I do first want to get your take, obviously, on what we've seen with this transition that happened relatively quickly after Chapek just had renewed his contract to go through 2025. What do you make of how this is unfolding? Um, Felix, Felix, I'll start with you. Well, I think Disney, the last quarter was so disastrous that it's not too surprising that you're seeing a change. Um, you know, Disney missed on earnings and revenue, um, you know, announced this huge loss in streaming that was bigger than anyone else thought. Chapek has had these problems, which you mentioned in terms of uh, with the creative community, with Wall Street. And I think in many ways, he kind of lost the faith of shareholders. So I'm not a hugely surprised that uh, the company would move on from him. It is somewhat jaw-dropping that they would go back to his predecessor, Iger, who has been asked constantly for the past two years, would you ever consider going back to Disney? Would you ever consider going back to Disney? And he said again and again, no, 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 no. And then all of a sudden, you know, Sunday night, 10 p.m. we all hear, oh, actually he is going back. So it's been quite a 24 hours. And John, as Rochelle mentioned, Disney did renew Chapek's contract for three years in June. Now all of a sudden, less than six months later, they're going back to Iger. Does this make the company look a bit directionless? Yeah, it's really strange. They had the opportunity in June to cut, cut loose. And they didn't. So, yeah, it's a weird look for the board right now. I mean, there are a lot of people in Hollywood celebrating this decision. Bob Iger is very close to the creative community. Bob C never got that tight. We saw everything about with the Scarlett Johansson stuff. But for Disney, I think there are going to be a lot of questions. And one of them is, why bother re-signing? The stock price isn't even that much different now from where it was in June. 
So then it's in, in terms of the writing on the wall, how much of it then just rode on this earnings data versus all these things that came up before it, Felix? Well, it's the accumulation of all of these things. But I think this was the final straw. And I think if you went back and looked at that earnings call, uh, part of what was so disconcerting with Shapek was really um, his tone on the call uh, was, was odd and struck people as strange. He's very positive, very upbeat while announcing these really disastrous results. Um, and so I think at that point, um, it really became a question of, is do we have trust that this is the leader to take us through this stormy period? Because, you know, let's face it, this is a challenge that's facing all entertainment companies right now. You have this massive seismic transition from the era of cable television, uh, which is really ruled for the past 40, 50 years, to the streaming world. And, you know, on the one hand, all the uh, cable channels are losing audience continuously. Um, and at the same time, the streaming world hasn't, uh, you know, thrown up many profits for anybody. They're basically huge pits of, of cost at this point. So making that transition from one world to the other is really rocking all of these companies. And I think the decision was basically after that last call, Chapek just isn't steady enough uh, to, to lead us through this transition. So, John, what will Bob Iger do differently or what should he do differently as he now steps into this role? I mean, Bob Chapek went to great lengths to restructuring the company, and I think we might see Bob Iger unwind a lot of that. And you mentioned before, Peter Rice was shown the door. Does Peter Rice get a new job at Disney as he brought back? He has not landed anywhere. So I think they're going to be, there's going to be a lot more outreach to the creative community. I think that a lot of Bob C's moves will be undone by Bob Iger. I mean, Bob let it be known. He told associates, he was telling friends on the sidelines that he was not pleased with the direction that Disney was going in. So if that's the case, I think we're going to see a lot that we, a lot that happened at Disney over the last couple of years, I think will be undone soon. So then, Felix, as we focus on the succession question, then, if, we, if now we're bringing Iger back in, who could then potentially succeed him, given that he's given that two-year deadline and the direction that Disney wants to go in? I mean, that's what's so crazy here is that, you know, for years, Iger kept postponing his retirement. And he kept, you know, for, there was this whole period of time where people were saying, well, what's the succession plan? Who's going to succeed? Who's going to follow you? And one potential candidate after another uh, kind of got run out. And uh, then eventually, right before the pandemic, Iger you know, finally handed it over to Shapek, um, which hasn't worked out. So yeah, it doesn't give you a huge amount of faith that Iger is gonna find somebody else and have a smooth transition this time over. So I think that's the downside. I think what John said is right. I think you know, um, you know, everyone's suffering through this period, this transition. Uh, you know, all the stocks of all the entertainment companies are way down. So you're probably going to have a very active uh, period of M&A over the next couple of years. And I think that's the argument for Iger, which is that, you know, he did such an incredible job during that 15 year period, adding Marvel, Pixar, Lucasfilm, uh, Fox. And I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities to potentially acquire other assets in the next uh, couple of years. And I want to pick up on that M&A point because you guys actually wrote about this in the book. HBO attempted to buy Netflix in 2006. Obviously, that was unsuccessful. But when we think about the future of M&A for all of these media and streaming companies, who and what will survive? And John, we can start with you. I mean, it's only going to be a small handful, but this has been the question for some time now, right? How many streaming services, how many of these companies are going to survive? Is it five? Is it six? Is it three? Is it four? Uh, this is still unknown. Even at Warner Brothers Discovery right now, they have a debt load of $50 billion. They technically cannot sell for at least a, another year and a half. But now there are open questions as there are job cuts all over that company. Could they be in play where David Zaslav, the chief executive, has to come out and say, we're not for sale? They're not for sale now because they legally can't sell themselves. But in a year and a half, what does that look like? I'm not sure. And by that point, Bob Iger will have six months left on his contract. Uh, I think the M&A landscape is going to be very busy uh, over the next couple of years. And Felix, what are your thoughts? Well, I think what's interesting is that all of these companies now are going to be under intense pressure to cut costs, to get costs uh, you know, down a little bit. But at the same time, 
you know, the U.S. Uh, streaming market is incredibly saturated. There's not a huge amount of growth to be had there. And all of the growth in terms of subscribers is really overseas. And that is a hugely expensive proposition. Uh, if you look at the landscape outside the United States, Netflix has a huge lead in terms of building infrastructure, in terms of building relationships uh, with creative cultures in these different markets. And everybody else is going to be playing catch up. Uh, how do they do that? Where do those, uh, you know, how do they pay for all of that at the time when they are under increased pressure to cut costs and have a huge amount of debt to service? It's a really challenging proposition for all of them. Indeed. Well, Ali, Felix and John, a big thank you for breaking all that down for us this afternoon. All right. Well, keeping it going, talking about Disney here, Sean and uh, Dave, I want to get your take on this. Obviously, a lot was made of how quickly this transition was. And we always knew these were going to be hard shoes to fill for anyone coming in after Iga. So, Shauna, what are your big takeaways? Yeah, I mean, I think the time timing of it was very interesting. I think it caught a lot of people by surprise. We just heard that from Felix and John as well. I think it's going to be interesting to see how big of a change Iger is able to make at Disney and what that timeline potentially looks like. Because we know Disney's problem right now is what much of the broader industry, at least when it comes to streaming, is facing. We've heard it from Netflix. We've heard it from so many of the larger players within this space, just the terms of the saturation that's happening right now in streaming and the inability of a lot of these larger players to really attract a large number of new subscribers. So what that looks like under Iger, I don't know how much he can change and how quickly he could do it. So that's a little bit, uh, I guess, just concerning from my standpoint. And I was surprised, Dave, to see the reaction in the shares. We were initially up over 10% at the highs of the day. Disney stock performance year to date off just about 37%. So I think going to what Felix said, Disney certainly lost some of the trust there from investors, from shareholders. Iger's winning it back right now, but we'll see what that looks like a few months from now. Yeah, you say a lot of people were surprised. It appears Iger was surprised because yeah. the words that struck me in his statement was, I must admit a bit of amazement that's from Bob Iger that he's back. <laughs> to me, apologies, but sports reference here. John Elway, one of the all-time great quarterbacks, Denver Broncos, returned to run the team. Kind of a second go the way Bob Iger is doing it to change his entire legacy. Why? Because he couldn't pick the next quarterback. He failed five, six, seven times. And that's really the most important thing Bob Iger has to do with all due respect to these two years, is find the next quarterback at Disney. He already had one go at that, and now is his second go to find the next leader. And if he doesn't, it will, in fact, change his entire legacy. I'm surprised he wants back in on this opportunity. Yeah, it's a different environment. It's a different ad environment. We're going into a potential recession. And as we've all mentioned here, the streaming story is just different. He's got to make cuts, Rochelle. He can't acquire an NBA deal. They want $75 billion a year, reportedly. He can't afford that if cuts are first. I think this is be careful what you wish for. I, 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 could, I can certainly see that, especially given how much he was paid on the way out as well, more than $23 million in, uh, in exit payments and benefits. But we'll see if this go around, it'll work in this sort of environment, Sean. Yeah, and also just in terms of his approach right now, I also thought what we just heard from our two guests in terms of the M&A approach, if we could see more acquisitions over the coming <laughs> years, because we know Iger has proven to be very successful in the acquisitions that he did make during his sure. 15 years. As they were CEO. everything. Yeah. They were but everything. Who? Netflix I know, has a $126 billion dollar market yeah. cap. They can't buy that. A little expensive that. at this point, so yeah. I don't know. We'll see.